meeting to order. Um, I do want to put add a item to the agenda, and it's just business that arose from our last meeting. Um, I had a couple of questions, and I'm going to make sure everyone's got their answers from the last meeting. Um, I went through all the documents today, and I have nine different reasons for this committee. And I, I looked at what the council, um, the, the motion that was made, and I want to make sure, Brent or, or council members, if this is what what we're focused on or have we changed the focus of the committee because like i said every time i read the what the commission is for it's something different so i guess Britt, christina thank you um co-chair <laughs> sandy um okay my understanding of why this committee was created was to go over the issues that had sprung up in dialogue at a couple of different council meetings about what I and maybe some others believed were the possible closure of uh, 11, uh, the purchasing of the property uh, off of Southwest 6 for a new uh, fire uh, station and you know either station one or 11 possibly being at risk for being shut down. I believe, if memory serves, that then uh, the mayor suggested that this go to a committee. Since then, it seems like it has uh, broadened uh, immensely in its scope. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I see. So that's my input. Thank you, Sandy. Uh -huh. um, I, I looked back on the, on the actual motion from... This is from December of 19. I did not find anything new in the November 2019 2020 minutes because there weren't any online. But the motion was to create a committee of city administration, fire department employees, union representatives, governing body members for the purpose of creating the framework for a fire department strategic master plan. So then my question is, are we doing their strategic master plan? But then something else said, and we're even digging down into personnel. So I guess Brent, can, can you answer my question? Because I really, I really want to just focus, I'd rather focus narrowly on, on topics than broadly on a whole lot of topics. Well, it changed and, you know, initially, as Councilman Valdiviaclos said, it started out because of the issue of the location of the fire station. But as we went through that, there were many that thought that it needed to be a much broader discussion in the sense of what do we want for our fire service going forward. And there were a number of things that would impact based on what kind of fire service we want that impacts how many stations we need where those stations need to be. And so that's why it turned into um, looking at fire service to our community and basically a strategic master plan. Um, that's something that has been felt lacking and that um, as we've moved forward, that that's something that we would um, need to do. And uh, so I think that was the direction that, that I, I had. Um, and so I don't know that everything can be specifically answered, but at least through the input here, get towards that master plan. And it might be that the master plan is, you know, created finally by staff, but that the that this committee would establish what that framework looks like. And so, you know, we, we make some decisions and those decisions then in turn help us to formulate the actual master plan. Okay, well, in May of 19, Chief Duke says the Topeka Fire Department has a strategic plan and it's been updated through 2022. Right, and uh, there were some that felt like that that wasn't enough detail in order to be able to feel comfortable with some of the decisions that were being made. So can we get a copy of that um, strategic plan if that's what we're supposed to be looking at? 
to you. Yes. I, I can oh, say. I can see you down there. Right. Okay. Great. And my other, my only other question was, okay, you sent us a link to the um, plans that we have had. And I saw where Sylvia mentioned just not too long ago, we look at all these plans, but we never put them into action. We just look at them and move on. Um, I do, I, I, I saw two more, two more studies. One was by Wayne and one Kelly Adams said there was a study. Um, are we going to, I mean, the, the study from Wayne was not too long ago and it is in depth and it answers almost everything we're talking about. Um, I mean, that was the fire department, local 83, the police, the GIS, the city manager, the ESCI consultant was all in on Wayne's study. And that it, it asks, it answers all the questions we are trying to ask. So I guess, um, Jason or yeah, Jason, do you have anything to add? Do you remember that, um, study? So in July of 2016, uh, Chief Wayne and then city manager Colson, we met at city hall and the, the focus of that meeting was to discuss how we could get an engine company to fire station 13 at sixth and Fairlawn. And the agreement that was made at that time, the verbal agreement that was made at that time was to close station 11, close station one, build a fire station in a central location in North Topeka on North Topeka Boulevard. And then that would house an engine company and a truck. And then the other engine company, probably from station one would then be moved to the new fire station at sixth and Fairlawn. And that was this verbal agreement. What happened with that Brent? Do you know what, is that something we're following through with? No, not at this point. Why not? Why was that? Why would, why was he brought up here to go through this whole study and then we're not doing anything with it? Well, I think we utilized it as part of the part of the process that we were looking at with regards to the location of the other fire station out on the west side of town. But um, no, that that agreement was a, a verbal agreement that I think that not everybody supported. So um, I guess. I don't even know all the details that were included in that. I simply came in and looked at what I needed to do in order to be able to move this forward as far as a location for a new fire station. Well, if we're going to look at studies, we need to look at all the studies. I don't think we can pick and choose. Right. And I, know. I don't know. I noticed today looking again at that link because when you brought it up to me this afternoon and I went back to look at that link and I saw that Wayne's study was not included. And the CPSM study is not there as well. So um, I don't know why that's the case. I thought all studies were there, but um, yeah, we need to get those two studies out there. And I know one of those studies, Colson, because I remember Colson, remember Sylvia, he wouldn't give us a study for a long time. And we kept asking him and asking him and asking him. Well, he didn't like the outcome of one study. So he wrote back and said, I don't like the outcome of this. You need to get a study that I like the outcome, Sylvia. That is true, um, Sandra. Um, we've had studies be done because they didn't like the last study or whatever reason they didn't like what the study said or whatever. And I agree, we need to look at all the studies and then look at where we're at. I believe that we are tasked because I've, I've asked for a long time that everybody sit down at the table. And Sandra, I'm sure you remember hearing me say that. Mm -hmm. We need all the players at the table, not just city staff, not just council members. We need the union at the station. We need firefighters at the station. And now we've got community members at the, at, at the table, not the station, but the table. And I think that takes all of us to sit down and look at everything and then come back to uh, the council with our recommendations. That's what I believe this task was because I believe when we we've left the union and the firefighters out for so long 
And why would we leave them out? Because they're the ones there. They're the ones that know the, the, uh, the, they know everything. That's the job that they do. And, 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 and to leave them out and not be heard, it's, it's unreal. And so I think that's the task that we're tasked with. I've read all the studies and I like certain ones in certain um, areas, or I, I like certain things in certain studies. For instance, there was one study that said that we need to take the fire station, I believe it's six in Oakland, and move it more out um, east. But there's no growth out there. So right now, we really don't have to do that. But there's growth out, out south and there's growth up north. So we need to look at those two areas that we either need to build another one, but we don't need to shut one. And I think that's where this comes into play. We really need to look at where the areas have grown and where we need to um, to keep our stations open and look at it. it and, and so I agree, I think all studies are important. And I agree that I, I think it's very important that we have all the players at the table. And I think we have that. And I think we could build off that and talk about that and go back to that recommendation of where this where where we're at and, and and different things because what we hear is and what i've heard is you know we can take this company to this the, to this station and, and not shut it and we can take this company to, and and just leave this one engine and da 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 da, da and rotate and our firefighters can tell us that difference with our response time because any time that you shut a station you are hurting another part of the area. You are hurting. It's the, the, the prime example is, Sandra, and, I, and I, I'm thinking you can remember this, when we only had Hancock, when we had station three down there, we didn't have station two. Mm -hmm. And my friend's daughter, she, um, her, her dad put her upstairs to bed and, they, and she lost her little girl in a fire. And that's when we started learning when, you, when you're starting to starting to get out of your areas and you're starting to close things, you're cutting off somebody else's area. I just cringe every time I look at District 9 and they don't have a station. I cringe. It makes me cringe because you're taken away from another area to cover another area. So I think this is a perfect opportunity to start where we're at and go through it and come back with the recommendation. I appreciate that you've gone through all that and I appreciate all the studies, but we need to really look at what's good because there's some good in each and every one of the studies. Thank you. And, and I agree, I think, um, but I don't, I agree that what you said about growth. So I don't know if the 2014 study, our city's way past what that recommended. And um, Jason, I know, I, I assume you've read them all. Are they all pertinent to our, city now and we need to go through them all dig through them all i think um all of them have pieces that can be pulled out of them and used i think we just have to figure out what pieces will work with with the direction of this city and and where we want our fire our fire department going in the future okay great so now that we've got that and oh christina Thank you, Sandra. Um, and I just want to reiterate as well, I, I need to do a more thorough uh, look, uh, probably along with my uh, civilian guy, uh, Chris Sullivan, on these reports so we can put our heads together on what we feel has changed in, in District 2. But what I can say is that, you know, just talking about the 2014 study, and let's just take into account where uh, station one is right now and the uh, the new uh, how much new how much noto has expanded and grown since that 2014 study and then you also have habitat for humanity uh, building there now and again what it's going to be is getting ready to call a meeting with noto businesses because I do not believe and it was not reported in that in, in that newspaper article last week that my unofficial count, again, and I'll keep saying it, is over 100 times since January, and that's a low ball figure. 
that station one has been closed. And I would hate to think about what the NIAs and the residents just all across that area and also the businesses uh, an industrial in uh, District 2 by 1 and by 11 would think if they knew that there was talks about seriously wanting to close down their station or having a station closed over 100 days uh, so far, which again, I think is a low-balling number. Okay, so I wonder, I, I, I don't know how we can go forward with all the studies and we each go through and talk about each little piece, do we assign, like would, would Jason be the best one to pull out what is still pertinent? Or do we each want to say our, our um, opinion? I think you need your fire chief to be giving you some advice related to what's in each of those reports. And that's what his staff is there for. Obviously, Jason can provide his perspective as well, but you know, we have a fire chief and some other deputy chiefs that that's their responsibility is to understand what's there. So, and that's what we're prepared to do tonight. So. Well, and that's true, except I know Jason's been here since 2014, you know, and uh, seeing all that. You still have the responsibility. Your fire chief is in charge of the oh, fire department. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I didn't mean to leave him out. I just thought, I know he's busy and not that you aren't Jason, but so how do we want to look at all the studies? Do we want to just take one one at a time and go through page by page? How do we want to do that? Well, I think uh, Chief Duke has got his staff prepared to go through those studies. And I, you know, if the detail that he provides is not enough, then we can go back and address it in more detail at some point. But um, I first, let's see what what they prepared and and then if there's still questions or issues and we need to go back and and uh you know like I said the wayne study and the other one if we've not done those we can do those next week and you know, next month's meeting but i i would at least that's what we had prepared was to be able to have chief duke and his staff go through these studies and what they the basics of those studies so is it going to be up? I guess I could listen to it. I just, I, are they going to be updated for now? Or are we going to listen to 14 and this is 16 and this is now and this is what we need? I think the intent is that to tell you what each of the studies said at the time that they were done. Okay. So Chief Duke, are you ready? No. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and thank you. Uh, I, I realize this is a really important uh, topic. Um, yes, I've only been here for three years, but I did find five studies in the bottom of a drawer. Here's one right here. I don't know if you could see it. It's like 19, 1992. I, I think we should just toss that. You know, obviously the, the city's changed in a lot of ways. Uh, we have a 2006 study that was done. It had some good bits in it, you know, but the one that I think is, there's two, only two I think we should actually consider is the ESCI. ESCI came in to do an update in 2016, February, which had a lot of great points and was more up to date to where the city was at that time which was really good. The other studies uh, I felt were one-sided, lopsided, and like you said, it's clear, it didn't involve a lot of input from a lot of the right people. I, I, I am like you, I feel uh, that we should have a lot of community input, uh, that of the, the sitting government, that of the union, and that of, uh, those individuals in the community that feel strong enough that they want to participate in this. Uh, there was, I did find a copy of that handshake agreement. Nothing was signed about building a station up on the north uh, part of uh, Topeka, up on Topeka Boulevard and moving resources to there and then also building a station out on the uh, northwest side of town. Uh, Tim Wayne's study did have a lot of uh, positive things in it. 
it took into a lot of consideration because the information was actually from a firefighting person. They understood the, the industry and how it works and how communities work and the response needs looking at NFPA 1710 as guidance, uh, not looking at population, but looking at actual data, looking at our call load, our call runs in different parts of the city and where they've gone up, where they're, they've leveled out, the busiest stations. I have here a copy of the 2019 Fire Engineer National Run Survey. And out of all the fire departments uh, that participated in this, Topeka was 103rd out of over uh, 300 fire departments in the country in their calls. Engine seven was the busiest engine in uh, Topeka and it was listed as 73rd in the nation as one of the busiest engines above communities with a greater population. So we have to look at the big picture, not just look at these past. We have to look where we're wanting to go. We can't just say, this is what we should do without looking at where do we really want to go. Our, our response types, you know, how, whether how many stations, how many firefighters, how many apparatus, the community has to make that decision. And that's what, <clears throat> we were here for tonight is just to discuss that, to move ahead and do our own plan with the input from some of the newer information that we like Tim Wayne's, uh, his study that he did and from the follow-up with the uh, EC, uh, what was it, e ESRCI or whatever it is, and their mm -hmm. study, but look ahead, look at, this is where we could be, where do we wanna be? We can't look back, we gotta look forward. Yes, we'll learn from our mistakes looking back, but we definitely gotta look forward and come up with our own plan. Not someone coming in and doing a study for us, but us doing our own study with the group of people that you have mentioned and taking that to the governing body and the citizens and saying, this is who we are. Whether our response time is seven minutes per call and the national, I'm sorry, the NFPA 1710 should be 90% of the time and uh, 1710 should be four minutes, five minutes. We have to decide what we want as a community. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't build a fire station in every corner. We just don't have it. But we have to build the stations where, whether it's moving resources and we get to a point to where we need to move resources because we are expanding somewhere else in the community that uh, we have to make sure that we give the same response to that new part of the community that we're giving to the rest of the community. That's my philosophy. And I, and I agree. However, those, those reports, studies were supposed to provide us the information on where to go. And, and, and so I, I didn't really hear from you what each study had to offer. What, what was the good parts out of each study? We can that we can know where to start. Well, I, I I go to the latest. The latest was Tim Wayne. Right. I don't, I don't know if you have that. Yes, I did. And uh, he talked about a lot of stuff from manpower, everything from the administration, the equipment we're using or not using, and and he looked at the the other studies, and from that he formulated his opinion. And you have to look at it that way. It's an opinion because we don't we don't have the resources, like I said, to put a, uh, a fire station on every corner. So we have to build our fire department to respond to the community as we see fit. Not me, not not Jason, but you and the community as well, and the governing body, because they have to decide whether we can afford to move this way and what pace, to, but we need to move forward. We can't have studies and throw them in the bottom of the drawer just because someone doesn't like something about that particular study. We, we got to take this apart. You know, Mr. Uh, Chief Wayne's study, and look at that. Look at that suggestion about building a station 
in uh, the north part of, uh, to be further up north. Looking at north, looking at southeast, is it, is it relevant to maintain the, the, the response times and the caliber of service that the citizens expect from one, no, from one is, person's voice? Okay, this is what I was getting at at the beginning of the meeting. This is a very good study. However, I, 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 I thought I heard other people say they wanted to look at all the studies. And Brent said that this wasn't really, there's some parts in here that's not, Where'd I go? You're good. I can't see anybody. Okay. Um, I think that's a good idea. However, no, not every, no one on here has that. I don't, I don't know if anybody else has this report. So everyone would need to have this report and look through it. And, and see if they agree that this is a good place to start. He kind of hits all the, all the highlights. Which one is that? No, Chief Wayne. Tim Wayne. It's, it's the one that's not online. It's the one nobody has. I mean, yeah, I remember the council looking at it when it came through. And once again, it was just put in the pile and nothing was done. And basically, ma'am, that's what's been done with every study. I know. It's been put on the pile and not been considered because someone didn't like a certain or particular thing within that study. Like I said, this is the cleanest part. This is one person's study, but everybody else in this room has to be part of that, considering the, the, the good and the bad about this, whether it's, right. whether it's financial whether it's uh, manpower, whether it's reallocating resources in different parts of the community, but it's just to make sure that we give the same service to every citizen in the community uh, that, that we can afford, both with our manpower and the, the location. Well, well, and Chief, didn't you say, did you say that you also recommended or, or a decent study was the ES, CI, is that one that you're? Yeah, I mean, that's one I. They're a follow up. Okay, well, I didn't know if that's one that was considered had any validity to it or or whatever, but that's a pretty short one, and and <laughs> you know it's saying two more new stations being built out southwest and. One, four, seven, and ten being closed. So, um, and it's not giving a whole lot of information, but that's just what I'm looking at right now. So, for whatever that's worth. Hey, Mike. Mike had something. Thank you, uh, Chair Chairwoman uh, Clear. Um, I, I think just a couple points. I, I think. Um, it, be, it becomes a little cumbersome if, if we decide that we're going to take all these studies or even three of them to try to combine and pick and choose and take what's the best out of them. I think we need to come, you know, quite frankly, um, whichever study it is, we're going to use as a guide um, that we can then go through and use it as a snapshot in time. Um, to me, it makes the most sense. I'm not as concerned with the exact content or what it says as much as the numbers and the statistics that are as recent uh, as we possibly can get um, in relation to the study. So, I mean, my position would be, you know, take the newest study, use it as an outline to start mm -hmm. going through and building on, um, you know, because ironically, um, you know, Chief said the 1992 study and, and let's throw it out, throw it out the window. Um, I get that, um, but the other reality of it is, and since way back before 1992, our population is about the same as it was in 1992. Um, so what's changed is the transition of where people are living, people are moving, people are building, and unfortunately, like I said, our population has not drastically increased since then, since the 70s, actually, after, after Forbes. So... Um, I don't think we have to recreate the wheel or, no, no. or, or 
or complete a, you know, detailed spreadsheet of breaking down all these plans to see. I think you take one, you use it as your your workflow, as your guide, and and you build on it. Um, not necessarily the specifics of the content, but the content that you use as a roadmap to address and then bring in new statistics and current statistics because I would imagine without even having them all in front of me, they're all going to be addressing the same type of topics, you know, so um, I think we're wasting our time to try to compare them all and pick from this one, pick from that one. Let's start with one, break it down topic by topic and move forward. That's just my two cents. Okay. I do want to check with Jason if you feel the Wayne study is the most accurate, up-to-date, or if, or if we need to pull parts from the others. Well, it's the most up-to-date just because it's the most current. But I do think that there's probably things that we can pull from the other reports if we need to in order to make everything work well together. Okay, so, so would you agree this is a good template to use? and then maybe pull from other places? Well, I think the template has to be whatever we decide what, what direction or what is the future of our fire department. And then you base that, you can use the reports based off of that information. Okay, so if, um, so if we get um, the kind of an outline, I know um, we, we do have the agenda, um, but then get we'll get an outline and you can all, you'll all have that and we'll pull from different areas and we'll see if we can hit all the um, reasons we have this committee so we can answer all the questions. But I do, um, if no one else has anything on that, can we talk about the prevention versus suppression policies? And I'm not sure, Brent, does that mean we're setting the policies? We're talking about the policies. But I know in Wayne's report, he said, and I, Jason, you're going to have to answer this, Local 83 limits the department's ability to create a succession plan. Is that accurate? Um, I don't know that I would agree with that, but I honestly, without going back and reading that, and then, and then going back through my notes from the meetings that we had with Chief Wayne, I don't, I don't know that I would agree with that statement. Okay. Okay. So Brent, the prevention and suppression policies, what is that? Well, it deals with uh, our, a lot with our codes related to building construction and those types of things. Uh, and then stationing our fire departments uh, in various locations uh, in, in dealing with uh, what pre prevention policies we have uh, regarding uh, inspections by our, our fire department in various buildings and those types of things is what I view it as and maybe Chief can go into more detail, but that's really the basics of it is we're looking at what, what can we do to even stop a fire from happening and then uh, how much do we invest in that process versus suppression. We we'll always have to have suppression because fires happen no matter what you do to try to prevent them, they're going to happen. So there's an investment in suppression no matter what, but um, there is some gain that can be had with certain prevention techniques. So Chief, what would you uh, add? Yes. So Chief, um, do we have the policies? Do you have policies listed out that we can see? What I, I, I visited the, Mr. Trike's office because I felt that the policies are, are you don't want to be looking, there's books off them. There's four books that they follow, international building codes, international fire codes, and the fire safety, life safety codes. But what I feel that this should have been about was, and I, I understand with our uh, those members that, that are not familiar with fire, we were trying to teach them the information about what every division does. And this is what was going to be spoke about tonight was uh, Fire Marshal Todd, Todd Harrison was going to come up and explain how that works, how fire prevention works, how the investigators work, how the inspectors work. So our, the members uh, uh, who have volunteered to be on this committee will understand better how the fire department works. And that will be discussed, the, the policies of how they operate and what codes they use and everything. But that was our intent of it, then followed by dispatch 
how dispatch works so they know how we get uh, sent the fires and so forth. We have the director of the Shawnee County Communication Center here who's going to explain that to them. And then after that, uh, Chief Kevin Foy will talk about how we respond to certain calls. So this was what I thought that this would be all about, a learning curve for those that volunteered. Okay, Christina. Okay, so I see the agenda. I understand we don't have this study, so it, that not all of us have seen, which I haven't seen, obviously. And so that's like walking around in the dark, trying to look for the light switch. Uh, we have prevention versus suppression policies, which sounds like it's very cumbersome to go through all of it and something's going to be explained, but we don't even have a base type of handout to look at. Then when we move from three down to maybe eight, that to me, I thought was going to be uh, the PowerPoint presentation because a lot of those, you know, they, they correlate with the PowerPoint presentation. I went through the PowerPoint presentation and trying to just get a handle on it with being a new council member, I have a number of questions specifically from that PowerPoint that I believe will help educate uh, citizens on here and you know somebody new like me. So are we going to be able to do that? Yes, yeah. in fact, the, the fire marshal has a PowerPoint to show you rather than just speak. And that was, that was it. We we're trying to give you the information in ways that people may better understand, whether it's numbers, whether it's someone talking, or whether it's PowerPoints. And then that way, if you see something, then follow up with uh, questions back to us, uh, particularly to me. And then I would uh, filter it out to those division heads who you have had questions about. So really okay. all of this is to provide all background information. Yes, just all like right. just like the studies were, there was a background about what we're trying to do or accomplish, and then follow up with a 101 on the fire department for our new members. Okay, go for it. So uh, first up is Fire Marshal Todd Harrison. Uh, Todd became Fire Marshal just uh, earlier this year. And he's been doing a great job in trying to move the fire marshal's office ahead with prevention, inspection, and investigation. So I will get him to step up and uh, present you this uh, PowerPoint that he has. It's right there. Can you, can you open it for me? Hold on, we'll get you there. Show. Oh, All right, they need to share that screen to you, Todd. Ask them to share the screen to you. Can you have a screen share for us on this, Luan, please? Okay. Let's see if I can. I'm not good at that. Yeah, move that out of the way now. There you go. That's what you're sharing, Todd. Okay. Uh, don't, don't, see my, don't get to see my face, but that's okay. It's probably best that way. Uh, I am Fire Marshal Todd Harrison. Uh, I do get to supervise the fire prevention for the Topeka Fire Department. Within uh, uh, fire prevention, we do have three uh, divisions. Uh, the first is public education, and we'll kind of just get right into that. Uh, we have uh, public education officer Alan Stahl with us tonight, and you'll see him here in just a little bit. But uh, he's the individual that tries right now uh, with the COVID going on and the, and the schools being in, a, in, uh, in all sorts of upheaval. The, uh, the schools, most generally, we try to get into and, and work with them, provide them uh, the message that they need. We're able to get out there as well. And uh, we have a trailer that we pull out to the schools and we teach the children how to do safety with at the kitchen, stop, drop and roll. Uh, then we also deal with the community. Uh, 
the community, uh, the community itself, uh, we're able to interact with when it comes to uh, demonstrating uh, fire extinguisher demonstrations. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be uh, to receive a grant here recently from uh, the Hartford uh, to uh, purchase some uh, extra equipment for public education. We are pretty excited about that. Uh, one of the other things that Alan does is he works in conjunction with uh, social media. And you can see by what's on the on the screen there that there's quite a bit that he does. Uh, I have Ring in red right now because we have just signed an agreement with Ring and I think everybody has a, an idea what that is, that doorbell with the camera. Uh, this gives us the opportunity to uh, strategically connect with certain uh, areas within our community that are could be a house fire, alerting those people in that area and making sure that they're aware of what's going on uh, in their neighborhood. So you can see Alan is extremely busy. We work in conjunction uh, with, with each other when it comes to working with the TV networks and put out uh, good service announcements for the holidays. Uh, I'm going to move right now into inspections. This is uh, also fire prevention. We have four inspectors right now. Uh, like the chief was talking about a few minutes ago, uh, they deal with uh, uh, quite a bit of code. That's fire code, life safety code, and building code. Uh, these are the gentlemen that get out there and uh, make sure that the restaurants, apartments, and all, all, all these public buildings uh, that you see are, are kept up to code and, 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 and violations are taken care of. One of the things people don't realize a lot of times is uh, these four, on the 4th of July, get out there early in the morning to make sure all the 4th of July tents are permitted and safe and ready to go for that day. But these guys do an extraordinary job. And you can see all the things that they have to, to work with when it comes to making sure that burn permits are taken care of along with special events. Moving right on to uh, fire investigations. This is a uh, three individuals, three full-time investigators, plus uh, we have Benny the arson dog. Pretty proud of him. It's, uh, he's one of 50 uh, within the United States. Who, uh, that's an arson dog, for, and we utilize him quite a little bit. Uh, the fire investigation is the law enforcement side of the Topeka Fire Department. So uh, whenever we do have house fires, car fires, anything that needs investigating, uh, these are the gentlemen that we call, uh, these are the guys that come out and look for what we call the origin and the cause of, of any fire. Uh, meaning, how did it start? Where did it start? Uh, but it's, it's also, they, they do a, a tremendous job uh, getting out and about as well and making sure that uh, they put out a, a, tr a tremendous safety message as well. Uh, as far as what uh, part of my job duties consist of, besides working with all three of these divisions, uh, we work uh, in inspections. Uh, we coordinate with quite a few different planning uh, groups within the city of Topeka when it comes to new construction, uh, making sure, as you can see up there, that they have the adequate fire lanes, proper hydrants, uh, the, the sprinkler system is taken care of. Uh, so we do quite a bit of work with uh, the zoning and planning of, of, of the Topeka Fire Department, I mean, uh, of City of Topeka. Uh, we also work in uh, working with dispatch when it comes to uh, the burn for the day, uh, making sure that people are allowed to burn at their own house. Once again, inspections is involved in that as well. They go out and make sure it's safe and they put out a good safety message as well. And probably the last thing that, uh, without getting too far into the weeds, is, is uh, we deal a little bit with uh, the news media, putting out safety messages throughout the year, be it holidays, uh, make sure you don't boil a frozen turkey, but it's uh, making sure that uh, the proper message is being put out there so our community gets the right information and they feel like they're getting excellent service and support. That's all I have for that. Do we do we have any questions for, for me? Chris, Chris has a question. Sure. Uh, because you are in the inspection side. Yes. Uh, 
what areas would you say are the obviously the oldest and uh, have the least adequate fire suppression systems in them, sprinkler systems? Uh, your more more uh, your older buildings that will burn quicker. That type of situation. What what areas would you say are are uh, more prominent with that? Yeah, I on something like that right there. There's there's a, a lot of older older businesses uh, downtown, uh, and they would be having to, to to look up some of this information to get you that proper information that you'd need. But uh, a large part of of Topeka has as an older style of of, of buildings, uh, and, and like I say, we're pretty proud of a lot of those. But uh, to give you a specific exact area I probably wouldn't be able to do that right off the top of my head so but I can definitely I would be happy to look into that and get and, and send you that information if you'd like would, would you say Oakland and North Topeka are uh, pretty prominent older neighborhoods with older buildings along with downtown absolutely I would say they would along with Central Topeka as well okay I, I know like uh, your Wanamaker area and yeah. out south the newer areas are, are definitely more up to code, I would say. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's, okay. there's, uh, there's a lot of the, the buildings that, that uh, are doing really, really well, but uh, specifically, I'm probably not gonna give you exacts, but like you said, the Oakland, east side of Topeka, uh, and like say, uh, downtown, there, there's some of your more uh, hot spots, I would say. So they would, they would definitely be areas to be more, uh, keep more attention towards. Absolutely, really. absolutely, yeah. and we do. We have the inspectors that are uh, getting out there and, and inspecting these buildings and working with the owners and, mm -hmm. and, and making sure that they're uh, staying uh, up to code, so. And I, I guess there's one more uh, question, whether you can answer, answer it or not. Uh, if a fire department does close or something to that, would that not hurt the insurance to a lot of small businesses raise their insurances? Boy, I, the chief's probably going to have to answer to that. I'm not, I'm not going to know right off the top of my head uh, as far as whether that would, would do it, but I, I would think not, but. Uh, I can answer that in, in to, if you're talking about in Topeka uh, fire station closing um, is not going to have any effect on rates anywhere in, in Topeka, Oakland, North Topeka. It, it's gonna have zero effect. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, what's next, Chief? Thank you, folks. All right, uh, we do have with us today, uh, Miss Melanie, Berger. She is the director for the Shawnee County Communication Center, and she's going to talk to you about that aspect as it pertains to our job as firefighters here in the city of Topeka. Okay. Choose yours. Good evening, guys. My name is Melanie Bergers. I'm the director of the Communications Center, and I'm just going to give you a brief overview of um, the dispatch center and um, really the, the critical role that the dispatchers play um, in the response. And I will put this up here for you. <clears throat> um, for those that are not aware, the Shawnee County Emergency Communications Center is the primary public safety answering point or a PSAP for all of Topeka and Shawnee County. We are under the sheriff's office. Um, so I answer to the major under sheriff and sheriff. And we provide dispatching services for obviously the Topeka Fire Department, um, the city police, Shawnee Sheriff, seven rural fire departments and three municipal police departments. We get all of our funding from um, Shawnee County general funds and then we also receive 911 user fees 
Um, my primary um, job duties are to oversee the 911 center and all of our radio towers. Um, we have a six site radio system that's a P25 Motorola system. And um, that's a pretty critical aspect of dispatching as well. A um, very brief overview of what happens when a call comes in. If the citizen calls 911, we answer that call here in our, um, at the law enforcement center. That's where our dispatch center is. Uh, we're housed between the police department and the sheriff's office. When the call comes in and the dispatcher figures out if law enforcement, fire, or medical are needed, then they enter a call and um, provide some instruction to them and start resources. While that dispatcher is on the phone, another dispatcher in the room is sending resources, whether it be uh, police or medical. We also have AMR in our room. <clears throat> AMR currently provides all of the emergency medical dispatching for any medical type call. And then <clears throat> we will stay on the phone and ask any of, or gather any of that medical information to provide to the first responders, um, such as Topeka Fire Department. We will then communicate all of the information that's received over the phone via radio and mobile data terminals. Um, the Topeka Fire Department does utilize those currently and then we'll update them throughout the, the call entry. This is just a, a brief information of what kind of things the dispatchers are tracking. Um, we track all information or all units, sheriff, police and fire, and then we can tell who's available. We also have the ability to see their geographical location. Um, something that we will look at in the future with Topeka Fire is um, dispatching according to the physical location of the apparatus. If we have a call that's in Station 7's location, but maybe Engine 8 is physically closer because they're clearing a call, we'll have the ability to um, send them and get a, a faster response time. Um, that's something that we're constantly in communication with uh, the Topeka Fire Department and implementing and we see to, to potentially do that next year. Our communication center takes an average of 320,000 calls per year. Um, of that, a little over 100,000 911 calls and uh, a little over 215 administrative calls. Um, the entry for us and the stats for Topeka Fire may be different a little bit because sometimes there are calls that can be handled by the dispatcher um, because the, let's say the citizen calls in and, and they want um, somebody to come out and install a um, fire uh, smoke detector. Um, thank you, Chief. They want a smoke detector installed, but then they change their mind. So a call may be entered and that's a stat and, but nobody was ever dispatched because it was handled by the dispatcher, if that makes sense. Um, the primary talk groups that we utilize, we have about 2.8 million radio transmissions in a year. Um, on the radio system itself, it's much higher than that, but this is just our primary um, duties. This is uh, just a snapshot, previously was a snapshot of our statistics. This is raw information. Um, that we could provide to you should you need that. Um, it's, it's a lot to kind of take right now. Um, the last thing I want to provide an update on is the enhancements to our process. We have been working with the, all of our partners, but namely Topeka Fire on a process called Priority Dispatch. We were able to apply for COVID funds to implement this and our primary goal with Priority Dispatch implementation and I'll give a brief overview of what that is, is essentially gathering COVID information from callers and providing that to our responders. So that's the primary focus of the Priority Dispatch right now. We're actually going live with that on Monday. Um, and then that's essentially to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. We want to be able to provide all of our responders with um, that information. As we develop the software, um, what the software will essentially do for us is provide the call takers a prompted call taking service. So this is going to decrease response time. This also, uh, this process takes into consideration NFPA standards. Um, this will gather consistent information. If I take a call and my partner takes a call, the exact same questions and information will be gathered for our responders. This is also gonna provide a reduction or more efficient resource allocation. 
An example um, that actually Chief Duke and I were talking about some time ago, and it's one I use when talking about this, is if there's an accident with injuries in a parking lot, currently an engine, a truck, and a battalion chief are sent to that. Um, in the future, we'll be able to ask more appropriate questions and maybe dial down that response. No matter if maybe they just have a small scratch or the airbags deployed, but they feel okay, they may need just one resource going non-emergency across town. Currently, the fire department responds to every single 911 call that comes into our 911 center per policy. So with this new implementation of priority dispatch, we'll be able to um, change our response plans with Topeka Fire and they'll be able to allocate resources much better. Um, another example for that on the fire side instead of medical side, a high rise building downtown in Topeka, that is a one size fits all response currently. Um, they get three engines, two trucks and a running chief, a running chief no matter the size of the building or any of, the any of that infrastructure information that um, the fire department has gathered in building inspections. So we'll be able to put that into this process and send appropriate resources, uh, very likely more resources for a high rise instead of just that one size fits all approach. Um, again, we'll be uh, developing in the next year and we'll be working very closely with Topeka Fire. Um, the rural departments, it's much different obviously, but um, we look forward to implementing this. Um, this is, lastly, this is just a um, example of what our dispatchers will be asking. Um, this is just a random call type that we've pulled. This is for a cardiac arrest um, or, resp or respiratory problem. Um, so those are two separate issues, a respiratory problem or cardiac arrest. The, the questions that they ask will determine the determinant code and how, if they need to go emergent or non-emergent. As I said previously, we do have AMR in our center. And currently when we take a medical call, we gather the address, we start first responders. However, with COVID, we stay on the line to figure out while AMR goes through this EMD process or emergency medical dispatching process, if the caller might have COVID symptoms. If they do, we clear the call out and the fire department does not respond. So we're solely re relying on the ambulance. However, now we have two AMR dispatchers. What do we do with that third call? This will allow our dispatchers to be properly trained to gather the information to share with the fire department, as well as give life-saving instructions and ensure that that caller is not on hold for um, any length of time. So I threw a, a lot of information out to you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, you said it would be decreased response times. How so? So if, while we're on a call, let's say there's a, um, a residential fire alarm, we will be able to ask more appropriate questions in the right order and get that call entered immediately. Um, we right now have what we call a call ready for dispatch. So as soon as I launch my computer aided dispatch, the time starts. If I take a call at two o'clock and the caller is just having a hard time giving me the information, it may take a minute and a half to enter that call for a response. We also have an upgrade to our 911 phone system that will help us with location information. So that's going to get us the location information faster. So the integration from our not newest 911 technology and priority dispatch and asking the appropriate questions could shave upwards of a minute or two off of them being able to get out the door and on the way. Good deal, any other questions? Good, thank you very much. Oh, Sylvia. Thank you. This will be implemented in 2021. Is that correct with um, COVID money? It's actually implemented right now and we're going live with asking COVID questions to all of our callers beginning Monday. Um, developing this and making it more robust for our city and county will begin in 2021. We wanna see how the software works first. And with any software implementation, it does take a while to really pull in all of the policies and procedures. 
I will say that we've had the same call types and the same response plans since 1997 when we integrated and con or consolidated into our dispatch center. So this is a really great time to really look at the call types that the fire department utilizes. They actually use very few call types. We'll be able to expand on those call types with this software and decrease some of the um, resources that are needed. Like I said earlier, we may only need to send one apparatus. Um, so the development will be the first quarter into the second quarter of 21, and then the resource allocation and response plan changes, I look to see implementing the middle of 21. Thanks for all that you guys do. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, Chief, what's next? Thanks, Melvin. Uh, Training Chief uh, Kevin Flory is going to talk about our responses, what we send on certain responses, and maybe this will clarify it some more for you. All right, good evening. Director Berger's kind of covered some of what I have. I'll attempt to get the share screen going here. Can you guys see that? Nope. Oop, okay, missed something here. It disappeared. Choose another one. It disappeared. I'll just bring it up and drag it over. How's that work? No, sorry. All right, hang on. Get the tech expert in here. I don't know about tech expert, possibly nerd, but not tech expert. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right, so let's drag that here. We're gonna share a screen. I didn't wanna come up on there. Show all of those. Yay. Hey, all right. Glad it wasn't just me then. Okay, so uh, as I said, Director Berger's kind of covered some of this and this ties into what, um, what she was discussing. So what we send on, on different types of calls is based on the information that's gleaned out of the, out of the dispatch center. So she covered their call takers are going to take the information. They're going to ask a series of questions and that will determine what uh, emergency response type is made. So currently, as she mentioned, um, we have a very old response plan system. It, it assumes that every fire truck in the city is available and in, sitting in its station. That's how the, how the dispatch system is built or the call uh, system is built. But what happens is, um, the dispatcher gets the information, they get the information at the location, and then the system determines um, what apparatus are already unavailable on other calls, who may be out of service for training, who may be out of service on other items, and then it pulls up the most appropriate apparatus uh, and sends it. Just a reminder of what Chief Christian covered last week of the different types of apparatus is there's four main types we have, the engine, a truck company, an aerial, and a battalion chief. We also have some specialty equipment, uh, the brush trucks, technical rescue, the hazardous material, and a light and air truck. So as she mentioned, we're pretty limited on what we use for call types. There's four general categories, uh, fire, medical, rescue, and then the miscellaneous calls. So under the fire, there's a few subcategories and we have the actual structure fire where the caller says there is an actual fire in the building. You have an automatic alarm that's reported by an alarm monitoring company and then the miscellaneous fires, um, it could be something like a, a grass fire or a power line arcing, things like that. It's a fire an incident that does not involve a structure or a building. So what do we send? 
we send uh, to the structure fire call, as she mentioned, three engine companies, two truck companies, and two battalion chiefs. And that is the same response, regardless of the thousand square foot home or, you know, the 12 story high rise. It's, it's all uh, the same, same response on that. So why do we send that amount? Just a quick overview. It's a busy slide there. The crux of it is, as NFPA 1710 recommends, we have no less than 15 suppression members on scene uh, when we do a hazardous environment entry. That does not include the management personnel, which would be the incident command folks. So the way our apparatus are typically staffed, we typically have four assigned and three, uh, three there. So it takes five apparatus just to get 15 people there. So that's part of it. And obviously, as, as she mentioned, you know, a high rise building is going to take more personnel. So it potentially could, could require more apparatus. If we go to an automatic residential fire alarm, we send an engine and a truck company. Now, this was a, an enhancement to the system that was put in place in 2016. Um, it was to try and help improve some unit reliability citywide, uh, how, how often they're available and in service and kind of put us in more in alignment with what other agencies are doing across the country. As far as the all other automatic alarms, your commercial ones, uh, it gets the full alarm assignment of three engines, two trucks and two chiefs. And then a miscellaneous fire, uh, those grass fires, power lines, things like that, we'll get one engine company. Sometimes a truck company is tied to it if it's a vehicle fire uh, where they may possibly have to use some tools to for soaking the vehicle to finish extinguishing the fire. Medical calls, uh, single units dispatched currently, and that's typically the engine and truck companies. Sometimes an aerial company will catch a call just because they are closer. Say for example, an engine company is out of a station and there's a medical call two blocks away. They're gonna go ahead and go jump that call, uh, not make somebody wait for assistance from a farther away station. The rescue call category, uh, typically it's a motor vehicle accident. Um, currently that gets the engine, the truck and a battalion chief. Uh, the engine company is typically handling the patient care. The truck company is handling any extrication that's needed and the battalion chief is acting as a safety officer and the incident commander on that. And that's regardless of whether it's on residential streets or, or a major highway. And then again, just the miscellaneous category overall, uh, that could be anything from the, the cat in the tree to somebody stuck in an elevator to a smoke odor call. That's assigned the specific resource that may be needed for that. Sometimes we get called to assist Topeka PD with, uh, you know, maybe they need a ladder. So we'll send a truck company with them to, to get a ladder for them. So as, as uh, Director Burgers mentioned, there is an effort underway to change those call types. And once that's in place, it's gonna allow us to review what apparatus are being sent to those call types and then look to modify that response. And that is all I have. Are there any questions? Well, you're, you're looking to um, maybe modify. So not to be rude, but does that mean everything you told us may not be true anymore? <laughs> once you once you modify it? it it means it's going to allow us that opportunity to maybe send a reduced and the example i know she used of maybe sending an engine company non-emergent to a call versus sending you know for that accident in the parking lot versus sending an engine a truck and a battalion chief and they're technically not needed for that based on the information they clean okay christina thank you sandra i have a number of questions first can we go back to slide two of the 18 where it says what is a call type so once a call type is determined by the cecc then where is the hub within the within the fire department where that goes and they decide looking at the map is that at three that all of that is decided and does that come directly from the chief or deputy chief or how is that how are you know, what goes where is right. determined. That is that is all determined at the dispatch center. As, as a public safety answering point, the, the computer system or the computer aided dispatch system that Director Burgers mentioned, it does all of that based on the information that they enter. Um, 
call type, the location, all of that. So if they ask a series of questions, it will, you know, somebody says, hey, my house is on fire. They're going to enter it as a, as a, I believe it's an 85S or used to be, um, as a call type. And that will immediately pull up, hey, this, this type of call needs three engines, two trucks, and two chiefs. And it will then, the CAD system or computer system then pulls out which apparatus are closest to that address. Okay, so depending on the information that is fed into the system, it's basically automated. Correct. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, on slide five, uh, this is probably really apparent to you, but it's not to me. Can you tell me, I understand, you know, obviously what an aerial truck is in the battalion chief vehicle, but uh, what are some of the main differences between an engine and a truck? Is the engine what has the hose on it and, and the truck carries different accessories? Yes. So the engine company is basically has the pump, the water tank, the hoses, uh, things like that the, for the extinguishment of fire. Um, the truck companies are basically a rolling toolbox. They have everything on them that would be needed for any kind of forcible entry, ventilation, getting smoke out of a house, ladders, things like that. The aerial company is just a much larger toolbox that has a really big ladder of 100 feet on top of it. Okay, thank you. Then when we get to the four general categories of fire call types used, that's on slide seven, and I understand that you all are working to expand your system, but I would like to know when we look at the uh, 2019 Topeka Fire Department standard of cover, um, we have a breakdown. We have the total calls and then we have a breakdown of, of calls. And so obviously you have the fire calls, you have the medical calls, um, but I, I would like uh, a definition of what overheat is. I mean, do we want to answer this one by one and you can tell me or are you going to send no, it late? Actually, I say, actually, I believe you, the Chief Duke or uh, Public Education Officer Stahl is going to go over that here in a little bit of the breakdown of the types. Those are actually <laughs> reporting codes that, that that's, that's mentioning or referencing. Okay, so in a few minutes, we're going to go over hazardous service call, good intent, and all of that. Right. Okay. Then my next question is, when you look at the, uh, when it says for um, what goes to a structure fire on slide nine, and it has everything that is sent out, this is sent out regardless if it's a 1,000 square foot house or a high rise building. So it looks like there is uh, a lot sent out and it says that it's based on the NFPA uh, 1710. I'm wondering when it comes to things like chemical spills on railroad, you know, like maybe a railroad car, uh, and particularly I'm thinking of Little Russia here. Um, if it is on either I seven, well I seventy, and there would be a spill from a semi truck with either gas or uh, liquids or whatever, is that something that uh, is first and foremost responded to by the fire department, whether there's actually a fire or not, and if so, is the same level of um, equipment sent out to what could end up being very hazardous uh, incidents. Right, so that goes back to the initial call being received of what information is given to the dispatch center by the caller. Uh, assuming that information is given, you know, whether it's a, an overturned tanker on the interstate or, uh, you know, potentially a rail incident, that will drive what call type is put in, which, that then determines for us the equipment that's sent. Again, this is all pre-built in the system, so we're not sitting there actually picking what we send, but it's, it's pre-built in the system. The good example is when we had the ethanol tanker on I-70, that came in as a motor vehicle accident. So it initially got an engine company, a truck company, and a chief, and they got on scene and realized, hey, this is hauling hazardous materials, we've got a leak. It's quickly escalated into uh, more equipment the hazmat team got sent uh, several other engine companies 
things like that. So um, again, it's really the driver is the information that's collected at the dispatch center. And that's why there's such a, a good possibility with this uh, pro QA system to be able to expand what we can send right out of the gate based on the questions that are asked. Um, are most systems in, in cities comparable to us have upgrades already that we are still lacking in this way? And do you have any way of knowing that? Uh, in other and, words, another, I guess in other words, are we dealing with an antiquated system? Um, as far as the dispatch side of things, it's not really antiquated. No, what, what's antiquated is the fact that our call types have not been updated or modernized. And that's where it's lacking it. So since 1997, we've basically been doing the same thing on call types. And, and this new software is a good opportunity to go in and change all of that and, and update mm -hmm. what we need it to be. Okay, and then oh, one more question. Um, when it talks about the fire, uh, it says to the thousand foot home or, okay, what goes to a structure fire? And then again, this is sent regardless if it's a 1,000 square foot house or a high rise building. Then when you go down to slide 11, what goes to an automatic residential fire alarm and there's much less. Obviously I'm missing something here that's really easy to figure out, but can you still explain it to me? Sure, um, so the difference is the structure fire is where the caller has actually said, hey, I have a fire in my residence. The automatic alarms are those that are called in by a monitoring company usually. Now at the CECC side, um, if they receive a phone call from, uh, I don't know, ADT, say alarm company, and um, they report an alarm at this address, and then immediately they get two or three phone calls from neighbors saying, hey, there's a whole lot of smoke and fire. They're going to dispatch that as a structural fire alarm, not the residential fire alarm, and let us know, hey, an alarm went off, but we're getting a lot of calls on this. So there is a way to delineate that as well. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I just uh, a couple questions. Uh, because you sent, like, for the structural fire, you send out, what, two engines, two trucks, two chiefs, or, or right? Um, are they all, they're not all from one house, so you're taking from different houses to get to one location, correct? Exactly, and, and that goes to um, the basis of a lot of these studies. They talk about station location and um, redundancy. The, the word that we use today is effective response force, getting enough equipment there. Um, and that goes back to that 15 personnel. That's really the key is getting mm -hmm. the people there to safely do what we need to do. So if there's like a fire on 6 in Topeka, you're probably taking from North Topeka downtown. And then if there's another fire in North Topeka, how does that cover? Okay. And again, that's redundant in the CAD system. It automatically selects if, if for example, say there's a fire downtown at the, at the law enforcement center, three engine from 4th and Jefferson will go and then say another fire comes in at 4th and Branner, the, the computer system is going to say, okay, three engines gone. It needs to go find the next one. It'll go over and pull six engine and send them to that call at 4th and Branner and start stepping out based on who's available in the system. And then my next question is, um, like if you go to a structure fire and it's just, um, you know, a trash fire, do you call people off? Like, do you send one truck home, one engine home? Yes, so all of the first in or first arriving company will check it out and see what's going on. And if they just determine they don't need all those resources, they cancel them and send them back. Okay, so they don't have to stick around just because okay. they were sent out. Okay, that's all I had. Great questions, great questions. Any more? Okay, Chief, you still up? Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Okay. So uh, we have Alan, Alan Stahl, who's going to do a report on the calls that uh, you go to the numbers, who, what, why, where, and when. He's the geek. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and uh, thanks for sticking with us. And uh, as the chief says, I'm kind of the nerd. 
um, of the group. So I'm going to quickly go over um, what was asked earlier about the different divisions of calls or classifications of calls that we have. If you look in the study that we provided, the 2019 standard of cover document, on page number 24, uh, there's fire station number three is listed at 318 Southeast Jefferson. I'll let everybody get to that page. On this page, it's a breakdown of the station itself, when it was built, um, what council district, all of that good stuff that, that's important to know. But that? Yeah. Down, yeah. down at the very bottom of it is engine three. Uh, it talks about engine three and truck three and the total number of calls they ran. For 2019, engine three ran as the primary responding unit. What that means is in that call order, they were the first unit dispatched it's their home territory. So if say engine one, if we run at the rescue mission, that's their home territory. Engine one is gonna claim that as the primary unit, even though engine three responds from very close, close by. So engine three is its primary unit ran 1,083 calls last year. Truck three ran 2,207. Fire calls, now this will be a little bit different number, but the fire calls themselves that is grouped of all types of fire. And those, these groupings, these classifications actually are from the United States Fire Administration. And this is how we report our statistics up to them. So it wasn't anything that we created in house, um, but it classifies about 25 different missile types of fires that they drill down to. So if we were to break that out into a large table, it gets very difficult to digest very quickly, mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine. So this covers every type of fire that you can imagine, from the grass being on fire, to the grill being on fire, to a structure fire, car fires, anything like that. The next one underneath that is an overheat call. It's actually overheat and overpressure. We don't run a whole lot of these in the city. Um, it's kind of a holdover from the days of boiler systems, uh, mm. and things like that that you had in buildings because back when we used to use a lot of oil heat, coal heat, things like that, steam heat, we would run a lot of calls where boilers and things, heating systems were overpressurized. So we don't see a lot of those. There's, I think, 15 different call types there, but we, we very rarely run them. We break down next into medical calls, and this is a, a multitude of categories that Richard Siegel will definitely be talking to you, I believe, of next month is when Richard's talking about those. Um, but this includes anything that we arrive on scene and provide any type of medical or first aid. So that way be we assist our EMS crew helping somebody up or helping load a patient. But anything that we provide any type of, of first responder care, there's about 12 different categories there. Hazardous calls, these are gonna be hazardous conditions calls. So they're gonna be things like gas leaks, hazardous materials spills, anything that's a hazardous condition that we respond to that's not a rescue like a car wreck or a fire. So that's our hazmat calls primarily. Natural gas leaks, oil spills make up the vast majority of that. Um, so that's what most of those calls are. A service call, a service call is when we're gonna go out and help the citizens. Um, that can be installing a smoke detector it can be helping them in any other way where we get there, the call may have been sent to us as an emergency call, but we get there and we find out, well, this really isn't an emergency, uh, but we're gonna provide any type of service, whether that be helping somebody up off the floor that just couldn't fall down, somebody locked out of the house, cat in a tree, that's a service call. Child locked in a car, chief just brought that one up. I always forget about that one. It, it, I'm, I'm a nerd, but I like to break windows with axes. So that one was always one of my favorite. Um, so that's what we run there. A good intent call. Now this is kind of a catch all care category. Good intents primarily are calls that we get that we never arrive to or cannot find the call. So the 911 caller had good intent. They called up and they said, I'm, I'm sick. Somebody's sick. I see a fire. And when we actually respond on the call, most of the time AMR gets to the scene, the ambulance gets to the scene before us and calls and says, we don't need your services, we can handle this. So we will turn around and route, we'll shut down, we'll drive back the other way. Other things can be, you know, fire calls where we go on a, 
and, and we get called off before we get there, we find that it's a different situation than what was called in and originally. We don't really provide an emergency service, but we responded with good intent is, is why that that is that way. And there's about 12 categories there. Next is false alarms. This category is everything you can imagine that an alarm system can break. Uh, we categorize it down in about 15 different ways inside of there, but that is false alarms, false medical alarms, because people even have the life alert system. So if we get there and that was a false call, that goes in the false alarm category. False fire alarms as well. Weather calls, Kansas, we tend to do a lot of that in the spring, as you can imagine. So the, the federal government wants to track when we're going on calls related to severe weather. And then of course, our favorite catch-all, which is the unknown, um, where we just try, can't classify it into any other type of event. Uh, we have very, very, very few of those and uh, our fire chiefs do a very good job of uh, uh, making sure our people get them classified into the right areas. So questions about call time or about uh, the call breakdowns. I have one. Yes. What, do we do we charge for false calls? Uh, not not start uh, and, and this is really best for Fire Marshal Harrison, but I'm being told that we do not currently. However, in January, there's a program that will be starting uh, where after a certain number of calls, uh, okay. after three false, three false alarms that um, you'll start getting charged on your fourth. Okay, that's what I kind of remembered. Any other questions? Hey Sandra, one thing I think, um, it seems like there's a lot of questions. When we talk about uh, responding to a structure fire and we have three engines and two trucks and two chiefs, when Chief Flory was talking about the 15 personnel that we need on scene, just so that everyone understands, um, our typical response is the first engine company goes to what the scene is, and they are going to mitigate the problem at that scene. The first truck company, uh, they arrive on scene, and they're going to do the search and rescue. So the first engine is on fire attack with the hose and water. The first truck is on fire. Uh, primary search and rescue. The second engine <laughs> arrives on scene and they stage at a fire hydrant as close to the scene as possible and they are going to provide the water supply for that first engine that arrived on scene. The third engine company will stage somewhere in the area and what they're going to be used for is what we call a rapid intervention team or crew and they stage on the front lawn of whatever that address is and they are there in case anybody that's inside the house, any of the firefighters go down or have an emergency problem. The second truck company arrives on scene and they typically will assist the first truck company in primary search or if of any other needs that that chief might be or have. The two chiefs arrive on scene and typically the first chief will be the incident commander. So he will be the, the chief that's gonna run that scene and the second chief that arrives on scene, he typically goes to the backside of the case address and he is the safety officer for that scene. So he's not only watching the backside of the address for the incident commander, but he's also acting as our safety officer on that scene. Just so that everybody has an understanding of, of what those resources are doing when they show up at an actual structure fire. The other thing that I would say that we were talking about examples of this priority dispatch and we talked about how uh, an aerial company doesn't necessarily get dispatched to a high rise with this priority dispatch and the questions that they ask that's one of the things that's going to change which is good so that if we get a high rise call we will be guaranteed as long as there's an aerial in service one of those aerials will be dispatched to that high rise structure so that's another way that priority dispatch can help us get the right resources to the right location Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chief, you got anything else? Uh, number, I think we're on number eight. Okay. Is that yours, uh, Councilwoman Valdiva Akala? Have we, have I missed something? Have we gone over 2020 station shutdowns? I have, I have, that's, that's number eight. Uh, it's number six. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Are you looking at that upside down? No, wait, that would be a nine. 
<laughs> we're on number six. Yes, that was my question on uh, that. Okay, let me. Okay. Do you see this? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> let me just go down. This is the total number of times that uh, we've had to take a, a temporarily take engine one out of service since the day that it started, which was April the 6th. And you can see for April, it, the days that it was closed. So eight times, I think it was. And then each month thereafter, obviously it's showing you it in everything. This jump up where we weren't, we didn't have as many days impacted was the fact that that's when we brought the new, the rookies out of the, the academy and they were able to fulfill, fill that. And as we moved on into June, the summer, we did have some issues in June, but then in July, you can see the days impacted with the, with any uh, temporary closings. And I think she had wanted to know if I remember correctly. So how many calls happened? How many calls would they have taken had they been opened? All right, I, I, did, I did email that to you. There should have been a, you should have had a, a, an attachment I will have, uh, Chief, I will have to look for that, but how many days are you stating in 2020, so I don't have to go and individually count, how, how many are you saying that Station 1 has been closed? I, I'm i just taking a rough look at it here, uh, looking at it, up until uh, October the 20th, that was my records, that, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a hundred. Mine uh, are not showing that. Okay, well, as one that was going by and, and pretty much looking for signs of life there, um, you know, my numbers are a little bit different than yours. And so uh, this spreadsheet, if we could go back up to the top, this spreadsheet you said started in April the 6th April the 6th and everything was just fine and dandy and always open from January 1st till April 5th yes ma'am okay yeah and the question had uh, yeah that was correct Sandy the question had been how were these calls uh rerouted and uh, also, how was it determined that station one would be uh, the one closed? And were there any, during the same time, any other stations closed throughout the city? Uh, you know, like uh, when one was open, something else was rotated, a another station was rotated or something, if there were personnel shortages or something of that nature. Ma'am, uh, there, there were no other stations uh, impacted with the engine one. We looked at that. We saw that there were three stations in that district, in that area. And we were uh, looking at the call load. We were able to split that between the surrounding stations. It's just like when a station goes out on a call, there's someone there to back them up on the next call if there's another call. We looked at that, they, they were running the same, the second incoming company, the station that's res split, re responding for pump or, or engine one, uh, got in there at a very nominal time. It was below our average. Okay, so what you're saying is because there were three stations in district two, that it was felt that station one could be closed down that many times. Is that it? That's correct? It had the least impact on the rest of the city. Um, how about the most impact on that area itself? Was that taken into consideration if it was closed? 
Were there any major fires that you're aware of during that time that any of those days when it was closed? Up, up, to, this, up to this date, there were two fires uh, that, uh, if I'm correct, didn't prove of significance. Uh, they were fires, obviously, but th they weren't large fires. And the response time by the companies that went in there were three minutes and uh, 20 seconds and three minutes and 54 seconds. Mm -hmm. And who was that? Who went in there? Uh, that was uh, engine three and uh, engine 11, I believe. Oh, sorry, engine three on both of them. And I, I did send that information to you. It was on a uh, little spreadsheet. That may be something that I missed and I'll have to, um, I'll have to look at. Look I don't at. have it either. I don't have it. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? I, I do have a, a large, uh, you know, spreadsheet that would show you everything, every little detail about every station, the calls, the times, the apparatus, the type of call. It's a large spreadsheet, but if you would like it, it's from January 1st to this date, and it breaks down everything. If you could send that to, I don't know if other committee members want it, but uh, I certainly would. And again, um, I understand I'm looking at this from a layman's perspective. Um, I also understand, and I think I asked if, just backtracking a little bit on this, I had asked if any of the districts Did we lose her? I think we lost you, Christy. She'll be back. Does anyone else have any questions? Hey, Chief. Yes, sir. Did, you, did you cover, I'm looking at the percentage of uh, medical versus fire called. Um, uh, did you? have someone that figured that out? Yes, this is all in in the, this report. Mm -hmm. It's a fire incident summary for all types of calls in each from each station. So like, would you say 80% of our total calls? Because when I look back into the, it, it uh, is. the Taylor report, it, it mentions that 80% of our calls were medical. Uh, right. Is that still it, true today? It is basically true today, 80, 20. Thank you. Uh, and I know uh, one of the questions that uh, Councilwoman uh, Odebi Alcala had was, how do, how do we decide when a, a apparatus is taken temporarily out of service? And uh, if you want me to talk about that, sir, I will. Talking about, you know, what's happened with the, the COVID, the impact on manpower, uh, hiring, uh, how many people were short, and what we do on days that people have scheduled off and how it impacts, the on-schedule leave impacts how, how our manpower looks. Well, I think that would probably be good just in a general sense so that if when when the chief of operations comes in the office and he's looking at who's showing and who's not and how you're shifting staff around and that type of thing, um, you know, just in a, in a general sense of how you determine staffing and minimum staffing and, and so forth. Um, and and uh, chief of operation Ty Christian is here and he'll explain that. He's yes. the one that uh, every morning comes in and looks at the, the manpower and decides uh, what we're going to do that day. Okay. Hold on. I just got just just got back on. I missed some conversation and I still have some additional questions. Okay. You want you can ask your questions and he can answer that later. I'm fine with that. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so just is it broken down by hazard area areas, uh, you know, levels of ha potential hazards in different sections of Topeka, whether that be by city council district, whether that be by numbers of station in a particular area? Uh, it, is there anything now or looking at in the future that will have a hazard risk assessment for certain parts of town? Ma'am, we, we would do it for the, the whole city. That's the, the, with the program that uh, the NFPA has hopefully included the city of Topeka Fire Department in, we will be able to go into our parts of town. We will look where all our calls are. We will look at everything that we have obtainable to us, determining the amount of calls, the type of calls, uh, the causes of some of the calls and then try to go in there, assess what we could do better or what uh, public education we could do to lessen the impact or those calls and the impact of those calls. Everything from, like someone mentioned that we have, uh, well, there's elderly and they may have issues moving around. We may have to adjust what we send to those types of calls. This, this will give us that information to determine what we are going to send on a particular call. Uh, if we look, we see, we can't do it right now because of COVID, but we have numbers right now that we have noticed that there are certain areas of time where we have had fires that they don't even have smoke detectors. So we will go out and we will, we will start uh, pushing to, to have smoke detectors brought to those individuals and installed. But until we get those numbers, until we have the, the opportunity and with, to work with the American Red Cross, they've basically stopped everything that they're doing. Uh, they get out in the neighborhoods again and do a risk assessment for everything that we can in that community. And, and what do you do in the way of emergency preparedness? I mean, not meaning to be a Debbie Downer, but you know, what connects different sections of District 2 with outside sections of District 2 is bridges. And uh, there's bridges and there's lots of water and there's lots of creeks and uh, there's industrial areas and there's agricultural areas. And while some people may consider those that are deemed experts that you know, three stations in a particular district uh, may be excessive, so that you know it's okay to close uh, close one down for what I believe is a hundred days. But you're saying it's less. I mean, you know, what's happening in that way of of looking at a particular district and seeing that they do face challenges in with emergency preparedness and laying out those possibilities and making sure that there is coverage because i'm just going to say if there's any kind of railroad if railway spill in our district it's it's and there's ha and there's hazardous material in there it's going to be pretty darn big it's going to be pretty darn big if there's an you know an industrial explosion or fire in in you know the area over where station 11 is chances are it's going to be pretty big too the fires that you know were coming from rossville that were coming down the highway uh you know that could have easily kept going and impacted that part of town too i mean i'm just it's real easy to say, let's shut this station down and this station down in a particular area. But I want to see some kind of proof that there is actually good relevant information with emergency preparedness and ha in the hazardous conditions in, in specific districts that would say, oh yeah, shut a station down. Thank you. Okay, Chief Duke, do you want to go ahead with your explanation? Chief Christian. Christina, I don't know if you heard, this is, this is how they choose 
who's going to close in the staffing? Good evening. My name is Ty Christian. I'm the Chief of Operations for Topeka Fire Department. I assumed this job in March. But what I do is I come in every morning and I look at a staffing sheet and I run, uh, run the numbers up uh, on the staffing sheet each morning, which is done by our shift commanders and two battalion chiefs. They come in that morning and they look at the daily schedule and they see how many people's off on what kind of leave and what the staffing is. We have four people assigned to every fire truck and every all 18 companies, but 99% of the time we're staffed down to three. So I come in in the morning and I go over the staffing sheet, look over what the shift commanders did and who they moved around to keep all of our companies available. So as of for yesterday, our staffing yesterday was limited to and, and our magic number is 18. Anything over 18 personnel off, we have a couple decisions to make, either shut a company down or a call back. Yesterday, we had one person on vacation, four on Kelly, four on personal, one quarantine, five sick, one on funeral leave, and two on light duty. Well, five personnel short on each shift. So that total number came to 23. So the decision was made to call back five of those pers five personnel back to fully staff all the fire trucks on Topeka Fire Department yesterday. I do that report every day and I send it to a uh, city manager and the fire chief. So again, people pick their vacation, they have their leaves. Uh, they pick their vacation and do their leaves in January or February of this year, they pick their vacation. Again, we are short five personnel on each shift. Any questions? Did I make sense? Yeah, so I want to ask um, Sylvia, I don't know if you remember the callback, because you don't call back as many as you used to, because wasn't there a, uh, a lot of the council members didn't like the callback because it, it, it cost us so much money. Is that accurate? Is that, I mean, why do you not call back every time you're short? Well, we do, we, we call back to maintain the company staffing. So if we are too short, we'll call back two personnel. Our max number so, call back is five. So how do these get closed if you call back? They're, right now, we're not doing that. Yeah, that was something that I instituted back in April when we had the budget issues that we expected with regards to the COVID um, loss of revenues that we were seeing and so we had to make some decisions related to cutting back on costs. And the one of them that we did, which had been done back during the recession was to, um, to eliminate one company and not call back to avoid the overtime. And so I started that and now we've gotten to December and um, last week with the reports that we had from the finance officer, we, we've been able to weather that storm. And now with the monies that we have currently in the budget, um, we're able to stop that habit of not calling back and gone back to our usual normal procedures of calling back to make sure that every station is staffed. And then we're entering into a new budget year. So as we go into January, that will be a responsibility that we that, that will be an effort that we continue. We'll have a new budget year and new budget money. Um, revenues look like they'll be stable. And so we'll be able to do that, obviously, Chief Duke and the rest of the department have to look at managing their their budget accordingly. And so that's always something that they look at and make a decision on whether to call back or not. But right now the policy is they call back in order to maintain every station to be able to be open. Okay. Are we done with the slide? Can you take that slide off, please? And um, Chief, do you have anything else? Well, no. Okay, um, then I'm gonna ask, oh, Sylvia. Thank you. Hey, Ty, this question's for you. Um, yes, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that about the callback. Um, Me too. Um, I'm very glad to hear that about the callback because our guys are willing to come back and do whatever it takes or stay over and do whatever it takes to uh to maintain and for the safety of our citizens hey ty i know the guys have to put in their time for the whole year at the beginning of the year my question um is 
is there any way, I, what did you say they have to have it in by June or January, or January, right? Well, it depends on when the transfer comes out. We allow them to do their first picks so that everybody gets a chance to pick their first picks, their priority. And then once we go through the picks, then it goes kind of into where everybody gets to pick their vacation. And okay. And the time people get it, what they need. Because one, one of the times when um, Fire Station 1 was closed, and, and I had asked somebody, um, I said that that was off. I said, they well, they were going on vacation, but because of the COVID, they didn't go. And I said, well, can't you go in and say, you know, I was going to be off, but, you know, I'm not going to go, so I'm available to work, so we don't have to do that? And Because I, I don't think they were doing callbacks at that particular time. And they said, no, that that once they're off, that's the time they have to take off. And couldn't we figure that time out another time? Can't that be done that they could readjust it? Because I know there was a time, Ty, when the firefighters, they kind of worked it out and we didn't have these issues. And, and then and then we got stricter on the callback and we got stricter on, you know, covering for one another and blah, 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 blah. So that was just one of my questions. Why wouldn't we you know, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't we allow them to do that? And then my next question would be for the city manager, um, since we're allowing callback with the COVID, aren't we getting reimbursed those monies back? Because that's part of the COVID is that they can't come to work. So aren't, aren't we getting those monies refunded back to us? Hey, you go first. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, at the first of the year, they gave a, uh, everybody was given an opportunity to turn back their vacation. And, and some did at any time, anybody can come to work and cancel their vacation. I think where some of the, the concern is if they cancel that vacation, they're capped at 720 hours and anything over 720 hours, they don't, they don't gain any more. Well, the city has agreed to take that cap off and extend it into next year. So the members could come back at any time and say, Hey, I want to cancel my vacation and, and they won't be penalized. Okay. So we schedule it to another date. So is that just for uh, 2021 then, or is it always like that? It, it, they opened that opportunity up earlier this year and it, it extends into uh, June of 21. Okay, okay. Cause when, you know, when, when the guys are talking to me, I'm like, why, why aren't we readjusting? If we're not gonna go anywhere and you can work and you know they need the help, we gotta, we gotta partner up. We gotta do this hand in hand and work together. Good Absolutely. seeing you, Ty. Absolutely. Thank you, Ty. Absolutely. Good to see you. City manager? Right. So your question was on the uh, um, COVID monies. Yeah, the COVID money. What we found is that um, initially FEMA was looking at being able to reimburse us for that. Um, in the end, we didn't end up being able to do that. Um, what we did authorize because of that, back when a station was closed because of a COVID infection, we did not. Um, we didn't hold that against the numbers that were being run by staff. So even though in the end we're not being reimbursed, we have money we could have used for that. We've managed it through the budget, but it ends up not being an issue. But um, the bottom line is if there was a station that was closed because say a whole shift had COVID and they had to go on quarantine and then their shift came up to work again, we called back in order to be able to fill that with other guys, that shift, because those guys had to be on quarantine. So we did that. Um, in the end, we're not going to get reimbursed, but in the end, our finances are going to be able to support it. So in a way, it all worked out with regard okay. to that money. Um, and we still have money that um, after we've gone through everything, we still have money that will help us going into the future related to that into the general fund. and so. Um, <clears throat> unless we have a lot of absences um, as we go forward, I don't expect us to need to go back to, to closing stations. I think we'll continue to call back through the rest of the year. I, I don't see that we're going to be in, a, in as difficult a situation because we've weathered the storm and I think going forward we're going to be fine with our finances. Obviously, every year you have to manage your budget and you never know um, what's going to happen. Um, the other thing I want Chief to cover is they mentioned that there are currently five absence or five vacancies in each department. Mm -hmm. um, we have seven that are currently in a class. 
and will graduate in March, Chief? Uh, <coughs> February 5th. Okay, I'm behind a little bit. February 5th. And then our intent is to start another academy, I believe, in March, right? Chief? In March, yes. So, so we have seven, so that'll take our vacancy down to eight, depending on how many retirements we have, obviously. Um, but then the intent is that in March, we'll have another academy. Hopefully we'll get anywhere from seven to 10. With COVID, we've been trying to max it at 10 in order to be able to keep the social distancing in the, in the classroom. Um, but we'll, we'll look to hire 10 for March, uh, more than likely based on the retirements that I've seen. And, but the bottom line is by the end of the year, we should not be looking at vacancies because that was the money that the governing body approved in the budget was to hire to full staffing for both police and fire. Fire can move a lot quicker. Their academy is not as long and they go right into service after they complete their academy. Whereas police, they complete their academy, which is longer, and then they have to go through the field training before they can actually be on their own. So, but we expect fire to be basically what I would call fully staffed by the end of this year, which will help the number that we need to call back because we won't be going against that five person vacancy on every shift. We'll be in a much better spot. Perfect. Okay, I have a few questions. Let's see if we can get these answered. <clears throat> so, do we think what? Mike, I just had a question real quick on that same top staffing topic, if that's okay, Sandy. Sure, sure. Uh, we talked in the past. Have we have we given any more consideration of t taking the age down from twenty one to twenty? I know we talked about that one time to be more consistent and competitive with a lot of the departments that are around here we're competing with for for um, firemen. Chief, where were we at on that? I, I remember the discussion with Chief, but I don't think we had implemented it yet. No, we, we, we've researched that, that at one point in time, we were concerned about the insurability of individuals to drive the apparatus and we'd have to come up with some plan and through uh, negotiations and I'm sure that the union would be willing to work with this. We spoke about it a few times during our meetings that uh, we would bring them on at 18 and they wouldn't be allowed to drive the apparatus until their 2021. That could open up the doors for us to get more applicants. Uh, they will still have to have their EM and so forth and their CPAT testing. But uh, there's options out there for us to work to get those uh, young people in here and start getting them ready to uh, give them those couple of years on before they start driving. And I know Jason and I've talked about it a little bit too in the past and, and, and Jason had some good, I mean, I'm not a big fan of 18. I think that's a little young, you know what I mean, still, but um, I think that's, but, but I think we're missing some good candidates, you know, that, you know, go to, go to, go to, you know, whether it's Butler, whether it's Hutch, whether it's, you know, uh, KCK and, you know, they're out of there at 20, you know, from a two year degree. And then, and then we're there, we're waiting a year before we can hire some of those candidates and, and, um, where if we were at least work 20, we'd be able to be comp able to compete for some of those people too, after they, you know, graduate from their fire science. There are a lot of departments throughout the state and the country who are bringing in 18 year olds. Kansas City is one of them. Well, yes. I think too, I want to, now that you say that, I mean, we're getting a new insurance coverage. I'm going to be, I think it's a question I'll ask of uh, our new insurer, how they look at that. Um, with the 20 year olds, I think that's a good question to ask. To I can tell, I can tell you that that we did at one time a Mission Township and a couple other fire departments, and that was not a, you know, 20 not 20 was 1920 was not an not an issue with the carriers that we represented. Yeah. Continental Western EMC, those ones. So for what well, well, that's definitely the first question to ask. It's a good question off. I'll talk to them. I actually have a meeting coming up with those folks in a couple of days. So. Okay, it's eight o'clock. Chris had a question. Personal Chris. opinion. 
personal opinion, uh, if you're not going to look at 18 year olds, you're going to send them, they're going to, they're going to head off to out of town to schools or whatnot. They're not going to come back here. My personal opinion is if you get, uh, 18 year olds in there and, and apprenticeship them, keep them out of the trucks, but, uh, who, let's get real. Who gives a damn if they're in there scrubbing the floors, getting to know the guys, getting to know the systems. Uh, it's an apprenticeship. I mean, you're working, you're dealing with a union. I'm a union member myself. I know how it works. You get them in there when they're young, they know the system, they feel, they feel a part of the system. And uh, I think you have to look at them when they're 18 instead of waiting till they're a little bit older. Otherwise you, you do lose a lot of good, good viable candidates. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions I think we can answer pretty quickly. Do we want a fire service that responds to medical call, fire calls or just fire calls? Who says medical and fire? Who says just fought Mike? Okay. And um, do we think there's merit in exploring the use of a sport utility vehicle to respond to those instead of a fire apparatus? To, to, med to medical calls? Sports utility vehicle to respond to just the medical calls. Who says yes? Who says no? Okay, so maybe we talk about that further. And is it okay to just send two on the medical call in case a fire call comes in so that the fire truck can still respond with one person and the medical call personnel respond from their location directly to the fire? Let me read that again. Is it okay to send just two on the medical call in case the fire call comes in so that the fire truck can still respond with one person and the medical call personnel respond from their location. Do we need to talk about that further, Christina? <laughs> Christina. Isn't that kind of out of our pay grade? I mean, isn't that something that the big kahunas should be? I don't know, city manager. <laughs> well, what, what I'll say is, this kind of is a follow on to the, the question that she asked earlier with regards to the sport utility vehicle, because if, if, and a lot of, I can tell you from a lot of the volunteer firefighter, you know, they will sometimes respond directly to the scene and then someone else is designated to get the truck and bring it to the scene to respond to the call. When you do medical calls with an SUV, you need to, the two individuals might be at that medical call dealing with that and then a fire call were to come in and there's someone back at the station they take the truck to the fire call those persons out on the medical call could then respond directly to the scene to join up with the uh, fire uh, in order to be able to provide the same level of service and number of personnel you need to do that fire call and so it's kind of a it's kind of a hybrid you're, you're following along how some volunteer departments run it and and so that's that's really what that's a follow on really to the, you have to say yes to the first one to really matter about the next question with regards to that procedure for responding to a fire call if you're on a medical call. How about I email everyone these questions and you kind of think about it and we'll ask them right at the beginning of the next um, meeting. So give you time, a little bit of time. Um, Jason has his finger up. I know that oh, Jason. the fire personnel would probably have definitely have an opinion on this. So. Yeah, just so everybody's clear, if if you go down this road of having two people respond to an EMS call and then one person responds in a fire truck, fire truck or a fire engine to a structure fire, that person's going to stand in front of that house and not do anything for the people that are having that emergency until those other two people show up. That's so that is one thing that needs to be taken into account that it's going to be awful hard to have a citizen standing there screaming that somebody's in that house and that person can't do anything to help mitigate that problem. Yeah, he's exactly right. That's it's the issue that you deal with in a situation like that. you have to have 
the standards two in for the two out for every two in right guys yeah yeah just a comment to me those questions seem a bit getting into the weeds um certainly over my pay grade i'd rather the professionals figure that out and uh, to me it makes sense that this fire commission would more look at the overall picture look at response times placement of stations that kind of thing and then base it on the best practices in that 2016 study just me right yeah and I, but i think these are the questions that we've been commissioned to answer i think this is what the council wants to know and um um mike did you have something yeah yeah i i i think um uh, um all valid good valid points I, I think what what we have to take the consideration to it whether this means increased staffing whether this means um, a change in how things are done but we can't ignore the fact um, as Jason makes a good point and, and those are the things we have to come up with something that works both ways but at the end of the day we can't ignore the fact that we do 80 percent medical calls and 20 percent fire calls and 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 uh you know, coming up, whether that's additional staffing to, to additional planning, different, I don't know what that is, but I think we have to, um, I think you have to, and one thing the council, I think kind of wanted an answer and some, some study on it is looking at the possibilities of doing that because, you know, simply put, if you're going to war on the ocean, you don't buy tanks, you buy ships, you know, um, so the same type of reasoning goes into if 80% of our calls are medical, um, you know, we have to be cognizant of, 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 of that when we, we work out our plan is all. But so, Sylvia, did you have something? I think we need more information so we can hear from both angles as well. Um, and um, I think that that would help us. And, and then I, I think this is great with the new system that the uh, call center that will that'll be going out because that's that's going to be another mm -hmm. another big thing to cut down um, to really it sounds like they'll be able to narrow it down. But as for me, I, I would like to have more information on it because I think it's very um, important that you need to understand that um, what shows up at the house, you know, people don't understand every truck does not carry water. And we had a situation where there was a fire and it didn't have water on it. And this lady was upset because there's houses burning kids in there and they're waiting for the water truck to get there. So you really need to understand the process and how it works. Um, and so I just think we need more information. I would like more information. Thank you. But we, but we do agree that we need to respond to both. So then, okay. Um, Chris, last question, Chris. Oh, okay. I may sound stupid to some of you, but how is AMR involved and tied into all of this? And is, is there, is there a reason we're not utilizing them, embedding them in with the system, or what's going on there? If, if you can fill me in, please. Well, John's there, but I'll, you know, they are embedded in the system. Um, we have a, a system that when a medical calls right now, police, or excuse me, the fire department and AMR respond to the scene. And depending on who gets there first, starts providing aid. And so from that, um, but then AMR has the responsibility of transporting from that scene. So both provide aid based on who arrives. Um, AMR always, I believe they always have at least one paramedic. And so that's something that we don't have a paramedic in every response. We have a couple of stations with going to three, hopefully that do based on our ALS, which is something else we'll discuss later. But. John, you want to uh, explain how you feel you're integrated with the system? Sure. Um, you know, like Director Burgess explained earlier in the EMD process, uh, that EMD process um, dictates what type of response uh, that we spend or that we send, as well as how we respond to that call. 
And we'll kind of go over a lot of this next week when we have an opportunity, but just kind of a high vision, um, you know, looking from 10,000 feet. Um, if that call is a non-emergent call, uh, one of the things that we did change recently when our contract was to allow us to have a basic life support ambulances in Topeka uh, that is staffed by EMTs. Um, those go to the low level calls such as, and you guys are probably gonna laugh and roll your eyes, um, but toothaches, stub toes, spider bites, a lot of the things that the system gets used and abused for uh, are where those units are, are actually utilized. Um, if it ends up being an emergency call, then we respond uh, with the fire department um, with an ALS unit, which has at least one paramedic on that unit itself. So very integrated. Uh, we have uh, channels that we utilize to communicate back and forth with each other. Uh, they beat us on scene. They can relay us information. If we beat them on scene, we can cancel them um, or we can tell them what type of assistance that we need. So very, very integrated in the system and, uh, and work well together. Does that I answer would, your question, Chris? Yeah, I would say. I would say too, Chris, um, you and Jason and, and, and Mr. Andrew, you can fault line too. There's also frequent flyers too. I mean, correct? Yes, sir. High utilizers is what we like to call them. So. Okay, so we have our, you, you, you should have gotten from Luann the monthly meeting task list so you have kind of the agenda for next next meeting but we'll send one out and then i'll send the questions out we'll send wayne no you already have wayne's report from jason anything else city manager i don't think so other than if you think of a question as you're looking at various things um you know to to send it to us and then we'll get try to get an answer um out to uh you know out to the folks before the meeting starts so chief did okay. you yeah I, I if you have any questions at all just send them to me and i will pass them on to whatever division i feel that should be answering that question and the only other thing i'd like to say is uh, thank you very much to uh, the gentlemen participating giving off their time and and also the ladies Thank you. That's Mr. right. Yes. yes. And, uh, but uh, this is great. This is a great start. We're talking and the crowd is mixed. It's not the city manager, the fire chief, the, the elected officials or the union. It's everybody's included. It's all inclusive. Happy Thank holidays. You. And yes. Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas. Feliz Navidad. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you, Sandy. Thank you. Hope you're better. Bye, Sandra. Bye. Bye.